Hi, my name is Juan, and I'm a postdoc at the Oda Institute, the University of Texas at Austin. And I'm recording a video that acts as a preview for the talk that will be presented at the MSML 2021 conference. So this will serve as a high level overview of what's going on, providing motivation and the details will be available um, at the talk, at the actual presentation. So this work is called Solving Bayesian Inverse Problems via Variational Autoencoders. And it's done with PhD students Suros and John and our supervisor, Professor Tan Pui Tan. Um, so as the name suggests, uh, we are using variational autoencoders to solve Bayesian inverse problems. So the talk will be structured as follows. Uh, it will begin with an inverse problems introduction, motivating, uh, setting the scene, as well as motivating the shortcomings that are uh, addressed by our framework of more traditional methods. Um, second part will be the uh, actual framework itself, the details of what's going on. Three would be results um, that we've uh, obtained from our proposed framework and four will be conclusion. So in this preview, um, I will be focusing more on one of setting the scene and seeing motivation and two, I'll give a high level overview and skimming through the details and the theoretical results, which will be available in the actual presentation. So um, just explain what inverse problems are. Uh, suppose we have a physical system with states y and parameters u. While the forward problem challenges us to find observation data y obs given the parameters u, inverse problems challenge us to find the parameters u given the observation data y obs. So uh, very uh, loosely speaking, the forward problem goes from u to y and um, the inverse problem goes from y to u. Um, uh, the, uh, the example that we use of an inverse problem that we use in the actual paper, as well as um, our illustrative example for the talk, will be the heat conductivity problem, the steady state heat conductivity problem. So this is a state in one, and one A is the governing PDE, B and C, one B and one C are the boundary conditions. So here U denotes the conductivity and Y denotes the uh, temperature. So to explain this a bit further, suppose we have a heat plate, um, which is displayed in the top, um, in the top image and suppose on the heat plate we have sensors which are denoted by these red crosses that measure the temperature so on the bottom left shows the conductivity distribution where yellow um, indicates high conductivity and blue indicates low conductivity so here in this particular heat plate it conducts heat better on the right side than on the left side here um, the on the bottom right image shows the temperature distribution with yellow depicting uh, high temperature and blue depicting low temperature because of the precise Boundary conditions says a heat source on the bottom, so it makes sense that it's a uh, high temperature where the heat source is located. And notice that the temperature is more sort of pulled towards the right-hand side, which is a consequence of the conductivity distribution of the of the actual heat plate. So the inverse problem challenges us to, given uh, measurements of the temperature at those 10 points, so the values displayed here at the 10 points, can we reconstruct the actual um, uh, conductivity that gave rise to our observations? How this is solved mathematically, uh, in the usual sense, is um, oh, one, of one of the methods of um, traditional approaches of f finding that conductivity is to minimize the function of displayed in two. So the first term is a misfit term. Here, F denotes the PTO map, which is often in the case of scientific inverse problems, a solution of a partial differential equation. So recall that um, U is the conductivity, which is a term in the PDE that governs the city state heat equation. So if, if here would we'll take a given U, map it through um, uh, the mapping through U to the observ observation data involves a solution of a PDE and a measurement operator that's not explicitly shown here. So it's sort of intuitively makes sense that um, to find the U that gave rise to our Y observation is we try and find a U such that when we map it through F, the distance between that mapping and the actual observed data is minimized. The issue here and the reason, uh, I guess loosely speaking, why inverse problems are a problem is because they are ill-posed. And they're ill-posed because if you look at the observation data, that exists in a dim uh, 10 dimensional space because there's 10 sensors. The U, however, if we return to this picture, the U we're trying to estimate is every point in this discretization of the domain. And if I um, recall correctly, that's uh, 1,446 points something and some number around that. So the discrepancy between dimensional y obs and u is very large. And in fact, what I just mentioned was the discretization of u. 
uh, it is more accurate to say that you actually exist in infinite dimensional space, whereas the Y observations, which are discrete observations, exist in the point finite dimensional space. So this discrepancy creates an issue because this allows for so, there are so many different U's that can be uh, put through as if that it matches the observational data because we have so many options for U and so little options of Y obs, sort of intuitively speaking. So that's why it's sort of ill-posed. And a lot of the options, a lot of the, um, I guess, uh, minimizers of this functional are physically, in many cases, in this problem is physically make no sense. Um, so given that we know some of them make no sense, can we design a way for us to ensure that the minimization of this functional will be more likely to, to yield an estimate that makes sense? And this is where the regularization term, the second term comes in, because we can handcraft, essentially handcraft a term such that the minimization of both terms, the first term is the misfit that matches the data, but the second term encourages our U towards some characteristics that we may know prior to you know, any data uh, uh, being collected. This is the stuff that we actually know about the properties of the parameter of interest. Okay, so the solution process of two is, can be kind of slow because often you could use a derivative-based, uh, gradient-based derivative, uh, gradient-based iterative optimization algorithm for minimizing this. It's slow because at every iteration, you'd have to find the gradient and also often map you through the, the uh, parameter observable map. So that means if you give me recordings of the temperature at those 10 sensors, I'd have to go through the optimization to give you an estimate of you. Our idea here is to come up with something more efficient by using a neural network, which essentially acts as a solver. So what that means is that once the neural network is trained to map from a given temperature distribution to um, the estimate, if you give me 10 instances of uh, temperature measurements at those 10 measurement points, then I can instantly get you um, 10 estimates of the conductivity that gave rise to those measurements. The reason why um, it's instance is because the propagation, the input of the neural network will be the temperature measurements and the output is the um, estimates of the conductivity. The process of going from input to output through a neural network is, is essentially just matrix multiplication, which is often unrivaled in terms of computational uh, efficiency. So although while the uh, inference process, the process of estimation is fast, the training process of um, the neural network is uh, displayed in three here, which actually inherits a lot of the original computational inefficiency of two. But there are extra issues with the training um, with the training procedure. So training neural networks are a data-driven procedure. So suppose here we have a paired data set of say we pull, we have like a thousand examples, um, uh, pre-known examples of conductivity distributions. Into each of those examples, we have uh, associated temperature measurement. So then suppose we have like a thousand pairs of these two, that acts as our training data. So what we wanna do is train a neural network psi here, parameterized by parameters to W, such that when you put in the temperature observations here, it gives you back the corresponding um, uh, conductivity. So essentially the neural network acts as uh, um, so solving the inverse problem. And the parameter of, I guess, the parameters that we're trying to minimize for now are the weights of the neural network. So we are trying to train the neural networks by learning the best possible weights for this task. Um, so the issue that arises here is associated with why neural networks are so powerful. And I guess in this case could be viewed as a shortcoming because the weights here are an arbitrary quantity. Um, this is why they're used so well in so many different applications because the quantity often has no association whatsoever with the actual underlying problem, which makes them very uh, flexible and usable at the same time, a bit sort of mysterious um, in the sense that in two, we designed a regularization of the parameter we're trying to minimize for using prior knowledge of U. In three, we, it's much more difficult to do that because we don't have prior knowledge of W. We don't know what those weights are supposed to be for our problem. So um uh, and a fundamental question if this approach is during the training procedure of the neural network what do we use as a regularization term and that's one of the main things that we address in our work here so uh again four is the same as before but now we propose a regularization term which is a second term of four here and this is proposed through an indirectly prior, uh, regularizing the weight so we don't know what the weight should be but we know what the weight should help the neural network to do and as we said, it helps the neural network estimate the conductivity. What that means is that if you estimate the conductivity and you run through a PTO map, if it does a good estimate, it should, map the, uh, it should match the observational data. So here we regularize the weights through the action, the 
uh, preferred or intended action of the neural network. Um, because no wild is the subject, you can add some memory, um, noise regularization operator. And the same thing here, we can add, again, this thing, uh, neural network is meant to spit out uh, estimate of u. So while the weights don't have a physical property, the u might have a physical property, and perhaps we can encode that, and in doing so, indirectly, again, regularize the weights w. So um, it's all well and good. So to um, tag on loss functions, this um, loss function here, six, actually makes a lot of intuitive sense. And in machine learning, a lot of success has been met by sort of just tagging on loss functions and taking a more of an empirical approach to, uh, I guess, uh, machine learning research. But in the cases that we can, it's very nice to have some mathematical justification of our loss function, hopefully a probabilistic one. Um, so that is what our paper offers in terms of its theory. It offers a mathematical justification for this intuitive way of regularizing the training of a neural network to solve an inverse problem. Um, so to now to move on to the connection and the high level details of our uh, network, it's uh, first important to note that the solver we're training here is a deterministic solver. So it gives an estimate of u, but it doesn't make a comment on its accuracy. Um, it won't be going, I won't be going through in too much detail here, but then this motivates um, instead of solving just a deterministic inverse problem, but an inverse problem that's under the Bayesian framework. And to skim through uh, most of the details here, um, essentially, we treat our observation data, our parameter of interest u, and the, say the measurement noise error as random variables with certain assumptions. We end up with um, a loss function, uh, 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 the equation here, 10 here, where the solution of a Bayesian inverse problem is a probability density and not just uh, its uh, direct value. And this probability density with the appropriate Gaussian assumptions and assumptions of independence yields a lot, uh, a function, uh, exponential term here in 10b. Why this is important is because th these two functions here actually resemble the regularization terms. So observe here that this is the two regularization terms we have. And 11, this second term 11a matches this term here, and second term 11b matches here. So this indicates that maybe the mathematical justification for 11 has a probabilistic root, which kind of makes sense because when you're dealing with data sets and, learn, and learning and training in neural network, it has a probabilistic underpinning. So this connection, this probabilistic connection, it, uh, is achieved through considering variational inference. So just do a quick overview of variational inference. Suppose PUY, which is our solution of the Bayesian inverse problem is our target posterior density. Suppose we pick a model that's parameterized by some um, psi here, or phi, I think, yeah, phi here. And suppose we're trying to map Q, uh, find phi such that Q is as close to P as possible. Since we're talking about a notion of distance, well, I mean, minimizing distance, we require a notion of dis distance. And in our work, we use a family of jensen shanning divergences, which is depicted here. I won't go through the details in this preview, but, um, Essentially, we have a theorem and a corollary that gives an upper bound to um, this term here. Th these are two KR divergences uh, and uh, Jensen Shannon divergence is related to the, uh, the KR divergence. Essentially, it's a distance between the Q and the P. In a case where 19 equals to zero, Q and P are equal um, when alpha is uh, equal to half. Um, so if this is an upper bound of 19, minimizing 18 may actually minimize 19, and that means minimize 18 will actually move Q phi closer to P. Um, the reason why we do 18 instead of 19 is actually um, 18 here is similar to these two here. This first term here is this term here, this term here is this term here, and this term here is this term here, and I won't, the, the talk will actually go through more of the details, but essentially, uh, to summarize, by using the Jensen-Shannon divergence, we uh, find a loss functional that it sort of mathematically justifies our intuitive loss function that we're trying to go for. And the connection between these two can, again, be read in the paper or mention more in the talk. So the overall um, architecture is this. We have a neural network that you put in the temperature data and it spits out the posterior mean, which is like a point estimate of the temperature and the covariance, which is sort of the quantifies the uncertainty of our estimate. So the training procedure, it has this loss functional here, which is based on our theoretical underpinning. When we train this whole network, we can remove the second half and just keep the first half and an inference will be just a propagation of a um, uh, observation data through the neural network to give us our quantified uncertainty and estimate. So um, uh, that is, I guess, the end of the preview. I hope this provides some motivation of um, our work. And we look forward to seeing everyone virtually at our talk.
Thank you.